We interrupt this regularly scheduled family room because, oh, I feel good. I wanted to just show you some things before daddy comes in and, and to show you some of the things that are going to be happening because we're going to give tools for happiness for young people, <clears throat> young people like me and even younger people like my family, like my family, like Jada and Jacob. Hey, let's, let's look. I'll show you what it looks like quick before daddy comes. Boarding, surfing. Hiking, things like that. Whoa. Yeah. Whoa. Ever gone skateboarding or surfing, doggy? No. But, you know, there, there are so many ways to be active. Like, exactly. Like you can also, like, um, like this. I am actively taking a nap now. <laughs> Not exactly. Oh. Well, you know. Yeah. Okay. okay. But yeah. I guess I could be mm -hmm. mentally active. Mm hmm. And mm -hmm. thinking deep. Thoughts. Yeah, it's a little different, but yes. Happy thoughts. That's good. Happy thoughts. Yep. Very good. Like me and a, a really hot. <laughs> whoop, sorry. <laughs> there it is. Wow. Well. Oh, Any. Sorry, lost in reverie. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I also like to sniff butts. How's <laughs> that? That's. Do you love that? No, not so much. Hmm. Not so much. Hmm. Well, for all of you dogs out there, keep on enjoying sniffing those butts. <laughs> and also, <laughs> lick your butt. <laughs> Any other advice, anybody? Or is it just up to me? I... I... <laughs> Hello? Hello? I have a couple <laughs> ideas. Like what? Doggy? <laughs> Doggy? What? Uh, what? What, what are you up to exactly? Nothing. Nothing. <laughs> I'm, I'm just going to go to the family room bathroom. Okay. Uh, uh, see you later. Bye-bye. Is this on? It is. Welcome to Oh, I Feel Good. I hope you feel good. I hope I feel good. I do. I do feel good. Oh, I feel good. Moving and grooving, dancing in my mind, dancing on my feet, dancing in my mind. You can dance too. You can dance in your mind, or you can dance anywhere. Like, wait a minute, are you dancing in my mind? We're dancing together. Yay! Jada too. La 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 la, la 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 la. Secrets to happiness, la 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 la. Jada, doggy, and you. Doggy, Jada, and you sing too. Organic intelligence, oh, I feel good. Woo! All right, welcome to the family room. I wasn't counting on that getting hijacked by a small dog, but I'm not surprised. You know, doggy's quite a character. Um, so uh, we're going to talk today. Well, I guess I should say something about Oh, I Feel Good because Doggy and Jada uh, are interviewing people uh, so that they are talking about secrets to happiness. And we're specifically really looking to give some tools for young people for resiliency, basically. And so Doggy and Jada are interviewing people, and their uh, interviews will be up on that site. Uh, we had asked on Facebook what... Uh, what a website should be, and Doggy voted for Doggy Guru. Uh, he, he came on, he voted actually several times for that, but mostly people agreed that the website should be called OI Feel Good, uh, and we abbreviate that to OIFG, uh, and so I uh, hope you'll, uh, you'll enjoy that. That's, uh, that's just one of our projects here, and uh, obviously spearheaded uh, by a better intelligence, which is a uh, small dog and a 10-year-old uh, Jada. So uh, uh, welcome, uh, Oh, I Feel Good, and uh, you'll see more about that uh, coming, and it'll be online. We have interviewed uh, already several people, including uh, Coral Crane Sensei, about Aikido. And so both on the blog, uh, which is the end of trauma, uh, or sorry, the, uh, the podcast, 
called The End of Trauma, and that will, that will launch here uh, in a few weeks as well. Uh, and, and on Oh, I Feel Good, you'll see uh, Doggy and Jada talking with Coral Crane Sensei about the principles of Aikido. Uh, organic intelligence really arose out of a synthesis of many different traditions, uh, including uh, the, the systems perspective, of course, that you hear a lot uh, about, uh, the complex, uh, complexity science, including the understanding of the fractal nature of our, our existence, uh, then also uh, psychodynamics, a really intersubjectivity, the way that early history forms and shapes us uh, and imprints us in the way we work, and the interpersonal school, which says so that shows up mostly in relationship. And so uh, there are those traditions, and then more specifically, uh, spiritual traditions and uh, mindfulness traditions, contemplative uh, projects and processes. Uh, so in the fourth way uh, traditions in particular, uh, I did my first zazen, for instance, when I was in college and uh, was a uh, contemplative practitioner even at that time. So uh, the contemplative basis of our approach uh, really uh, shows up in, in all of the materials that you see, uh, as well as uh, other traditions like Aikido in, in particular, the, the nature of joining that, that we talk about. This, this broadcast is the second of two about attunement, and that attunement then really is informed by the nature of joining. And joining in Aikido is this principle of, of a kind of feng shui of non-resistance. So, uh, and, uh, and then the, another tradition that, that runs deep here, uh, of course, is the somatic experiencing groups, the Peter Levine tradition that, uh, that shaped um, the, and furthered, further helped my clarification on how change happens. And, and two, the direction of the Ericksonian hypnotherapy group. And I uh, studied really with all of the major Ericksonian students, the students of Milton Erickson, uh, including consulting on my, um, on my master's thesis with Ernest Rossi, who wrote the collected works uh, and was one of the closest collaborators with Milton Erickson. And then uh, the, the learning that I did for many years with Stephen Gilligan, self-relations. And uh, if you don't know of that work, that's also a really uh, lovely body of work done by a, a heartful and, uh, uh, and really super intelligent uh, person named Stephen Gilligan. So uh, you can check that out as well. And so uh, hopefully we'll get uh, many of these conversations happening with Doggy. And the supposition behind that is, especially for those of us that are trying to articulate tools for resiliency and wellness uh, into the world, that uh, that if a, a high-level professional can speak to a 10-year-old level or even a, a doggy uh, level, then uh, that simplicity is a truly and deeply well-integrated process. So uh, the, the art of simplicity is really something. And so um, I hope you will uh, you'll continue to support our, our evolution in this process and allow a, a broader viewership of these important principles that, that you've, you are coming to know more and more. So there's Oh, I Feel Good, uh, a small dog, uh, and Jada interviewing Secrets to Happiness, interviewing people on Secrets to Happiness. Uh, in, the one, in, this, in the shot that you saw that Doggy put up there, that was with Jacob. And, and so he had some ideas on Secrets to Happiness as well. And, um, and Doggy's madcap uh, beanie baby brain got to work there, and I, I, think, uh, I think you'll enjoy all of that. So uh, thank you for watching, tuning in here to the family room. This is, this is part two of our family room. And so in part one, we began to speak about attunement. Uh, and phase two attunement in particular. And then I really spent that section and that last session in the family room laying out the context of all of this also, which is our three-phase model. Because we're going to look at phase two tools here. Uh, and our phase two tools are things that a person can be doing that reliably help systems begin to organize enough uh, coming out of the phase one set of chaos uh, into uh, the phase two work and then the phase two work, organizing things enough so that uh, really uh, the, the system itself, the biology itself, 
comes to organize itself. And that's, that's then the phase three work. There are specific tools, there are specific protocols, and part of what we're going to look at today then is the protocol for phase two work. And I, I should say some of this then is, um, is preparatory for our OI expert class. Uh, if, you've, if you've trained, say, in organic intelligence uh, or another somatic uh, approach and feel really comfortable and conversant in the, in the observation, in the subtle observation of the, of the body process, then uh, what we are doing here uh, may be of interest to you at the expert level. Uh, organic intelligence is an interpersonal biofeedback approach within this complex, complex science, nonlinear uh, understanding of the complexity of the, of the human organism. And so as what we propose, of course, is that your, your work and our work in organic intelligence is to learn more and more refined ways of seeing how how your neurobiology, how your client's organism is all the time presenting information and is behaving in ways uh, that, are, that, that, that represent uh, signals of self-organization, signals of self-organization that then we reflect back adeptly enough and in an attuned fashion enough that then the person can use that information, they can receive that information in a way that it is, I believe, intended. That is, there is information, behavior, the biology is presenting all of these supports that are meant for systemic reorganization that have largely been missed. Uh, this is why, uh, this is the addition really that, uh, that uh, organic intelligence is bringing in. That is, it's, it's uh, sometimes, uh, Surely, uh, there is information in the somatic field. So tr somatic tracking, somatic experiencing may be helpful at times to be able to support and reinforce self-organizing information. However, there are other times that it's not. There are also ways in which image uh, comes in and, and the biology presents in the image channel information that is meaningfully intended to help that system reorganize. Also, uh, there is uh, likely this channel of thought, of cognition, how one thinks. There are times in which cognition and thought is the channel in which that organizing signal is coming through or in feeling, in affect. So uh, in all of these isoma channels, then the information that is uniquely in the moment intended by the biology to help that system catalyze its self-reorganizational mojo is coming through. And I, I am here to help you learn more and more subtle ways because it may be really gross things. Like a person says, oh, you know, I, uh, I just thought of my grandma. And, uh, and I saw an image of her and, and her holding me as a baby. That, right? That's obviously what, what you would think of as a blue. Blue in this context meaning not only it's a positive affect thing, but it is actually a signal of self-organization. So that's in the image channel. It may be a sensation. right? It may be a, another thought like, oh, I feel good. Uh, or it may be a feeling. All of these then start out at the really gross level, but as we become more differentiated, as we become more and more expert, then that expertise means I am able to more and more subtly uh, feed back into a person's systems the various channels in which their system is trying to reorganize itself. And that reorganization and the way that I'm feeding that back may be as uh, simple as saying, oh, I wonder if you would be able to, you know, just see that image of you with your grandma. Or uh, it may be uh, a signal like this. You see the way my, my head just went up and down? That may signal into the biology because I'm trying to speak to the biology directly. It takes a long time, you know, in terms of our are three errors here. Uh, it takes a long time to be able to fully participate in the uh, experience of the cycling and the fractal cycles of red-blue that, uh, that are coming in. And so initially, my reinforcers, my support, are very often um, uh, non-conscious and quite subtle. So uh, the, the work uh, takes a little while because of that, because we're trying to speak to 
patterns of the respiration. We're trying to speak to patterns of muscle movement. We're trying to speak to patterns of, of integration, the way that, you know, the, the breath is integrating along the, the articulation of the spine, you know. We're, we're trying to, to support when the coloration, for instance, uh, you know, shows up as being, again, more uh, modulated and better integrated. So there are all these levels in which uh, we propose that we are feeding back self-organizing information from the system itself. That's organic intelligence. So uh, uh, that's all that to say that if you feel like you are conversant enough in observing the body, in observing the sensation work, then, uh, then consider the, uh, the level of the OI Expert course, because the OI Expert course uh, is where we will take you through all the ways of working in this three-phase model and ways of really seeing phase two stabilization. The first three classes of the OI Expert class are really intended to help that system move from phase one to phase two, become expert in phase two work, which is part of our topic today, uh, and those classes are just the overview class, the, the shifting paradigms. Uh, these family room recordings are excellent for really lining out these simple and rudimentary steps. Uh, and, and then the second class is from image to archetype, because working with image is really key for deactivating and really getting people out of phase one, because phase one is disorganized so much because of the freeze system or that, that dorsal vagal system. So working an image is really key to help people come out of so much freeze and disorientation so that then they can begin to mobilize around sympathetic, uh, sympathetically driven and uh, sympathetic nervous system driven actions that will reliably take a person then into, into phase three. Then reliably help them understand what's good, what's helpful, what's, what's wholesome for them and really uh, help people organize their systems so that they then can do phase three work. Uh, the, and I'm coming back to phase two, but, uh, but the phase three work then has, again, a, a whole set of full-length master classes. So the, the fourth class after phase two is multiple trauma vortex, really seeing the fractal reiteration and understanding that once you get into phase three, now you're going to see the fractal process. You're going to see the biology operating according to the principles that I've been talking about for a decade, these principles of periodicity, rhythmicity, and the way that the fractal reiteration shows up, including in the next class, which is first 30 seconds in holographic blue. And, and in that, we're understanding that if you see that fractal form coming up in the first 30 seconds, as it often shows up, that fractal form reiterates. It shows up over and over again in different forms in the session once you get to phase three. So that, uh, that fractal form uh, is key to understanding the unfolding of the session. And the understanding of, or, of the holographic blue uh, says that the psyche will often present an overarching kind of resource or framework or paradigm that is the, the mapping of the unfolding of the complex often that's going to show up in that session. That's holographic blue. People ask me about that a lot. So uh, that's that course, uh, the first 30 seconds in holographic blue is then followed by the fractal reiteration of trauma across generations, multi-generational, cross-generational transfer of traumatic form, reiteration, right? That's fractal. And that class is called Love and Lineage. And so that's the sixth class in the, in the whole series uh, and really important to understand intergenerational trauma and work with that in a way that is not traumatic uh, and is actually deeply integrating. So uh, the last class is Fractal Mind and the Free Association Conversation. And that's, that's where, you know, many years ago I laid out the form uh, of what we were doing and laid out the, uh, more and more of the ideas of this complexity science in which, you know, the fractalicious understandings are. So uh, that Fractal Mind and the Free Association Conversation is the seventh class. So there are two sets, an OI expert, there are two, two classes, there are two sets of classes. The first set allow you to really facilitate that movement from phase one to phase two. And phase two, uh, then once you get the system reliably 
stabilizing in phase two, then you begin to see that fractal form showing up in phase three. And then the courses of phase three, multiple trauma vortex, first 30 seconds holographic blue, love and lineage, fractal mind and the free association conversation. Those classes then tell you how to work in phase three because each of these phases is distinct and you have to work in an attuned fashion across all of those, which means in phase one, there's an attunement to phase one behavior and mindset. Phase two, there is orienting and attuning within that phase of that, that mindset. And then phase three is then the work and the attunement in that set. And these are all very different. And with, and I, and I spoke about this in the last family room, you may want to check it out. So in phase two, the class phase two, which is the third class of the OI expert range, then uh, we are looking at how one can support a person's movement from phase two to phase three. So this family room broadcast and conversation, I hope, will be about lining out the ways of attuning in phase two, not phase one or phase three, in phase two to, to really reinforce and galvanize a person's motivation and wise, and wise action in their own behalf. That is, they are gaining agency for how to work. So, um, so the, the work with uh, phase two here that we're going to do today is to begin to look at how uh, phase two work uh, can happen across the isoma channels in relationship to the, uh, the, the isoma elements. So uh, attunement happens at these, these various levels. So uh, Wilt Brummel will do this, uh, this map here. Attunement means, uh, first of all, the attunement to these, uh, these three phases, phase one, phase two, phase three, because your overall set uh, of interventions has to be guided by that level of attunement. And uh, so just a reminder, phase one means we're going to be reinforcing when those blues arise. They're often pretty subtle, helping the person uh, become more oriented toward uh, actions that they can be taking, uh, largely not by telling them what to do because the person can't use that information here, but by subtly reinforcing what is already happening. Phase two, the person is beginning to marshal enough ego strength, hopefully, to be able to take action and to organize their action on their own behalf. <clears throat> I can't, you know, it's, it's really a thing that people come out of phase one and they're like, you know, I knew I should be doing this. I knew what the right thing was to do, but I just couldn't get there. You know, I, I kept on doing these other things. That's the addiction. That's the addiction to intensity. That's various addiction. That can be substance abuse addiction, uh, addiction, and disorientation. So in phase two, we're going to be orienting uh, in this kind of continuum of ways that a person can support themselves. And this is ego strengthening. Um, and uh, so phase three, we're then being much more laissez-faire because the system is self-organizing and my intervention or the client's intervention on that process will disrupt the intrinsic process of that self-organizational um, biology. Uh, we can't self-organize. We can do good phase two work that will help the system hopefully lean toward and lead into self-organization, but self-organization in the end means the biology is synchronizing um, millions of different processes, right? So uh, this interpersonal biofeedback means I am feeding back information from the system that will lead reliably toward the return to its intrinsic biosynchrony. So when people have, sy have symptoms, they are desynced when they are uh, returning into greater synchrony, that's phase three work, and it's happening at the biological level. Uh, and, and it is so complex that we need to take our hands off of how things are working there. I'm still monitoring that oscillatory process, that integration process. But uh, you can see that in phase three, if you look at your graphic, you'll see that's letting go of control. That takes, that takes quite some time to get to, which, but we do it on a regular basis and our and our, uh, our students uh, do it quite well as well. So um, 
so that's the first level of attunement. The first level of attunement is which phase am I primarily working at? I'm, I'm working phase one, phase two on an ongoing basis. I'm always going to be reinforcing the self-organizing uh, information. But uh, the phase two work in particular is what we're going to look at today. That's the, and, uh, the attunement to those three phases is one level of attunement. The next level of attunement is then to see where the system is trying to return and, and stabilize its fractal form, which is red-blue. That's the fractal, going up, going down, expanding, contracting, the, the red-blue, the two sides. So uh, this, is, this is why, you know, 15, 20 years ago in, in Switzerland, I really proposed a language away from using terms like trauma vortex, Right, because there at the time, uh, that was it. It was the trauma vortex and the healing vortex, and and that that simply described a polarized system. Everybody comes in really polarized. Well, the point of our work is to really see how there is this f relationship between those reds and blues. Not that there's a good one, there's a bad one, but that they are both intrinsic. And what is problematic is the loss of that intrinsic relationship. So, uh, so we attune then also to that pulsative process, that oscillatory process. Uh, and uh, really, we owe a uh, depth of gratitude to uh, the tradition right out of, uh, of Dick Olney. So much of the somatic experiences uh, that you are seeing taught now uh, really come out of that Olney tradition because of Peter Levine's association with Dick Olney, the way then that he is. Uh, he was working, you know, with Pat Ogden and our friend Angwin St. Just early on and, um, and really uh, contributing to this understanding of the ways of, uh, of oscillation. And so, you know, in, in Olney's site, uh, Alive and Real, uh, he would say, okay, now, uh, Fritz, he was talking about Fritz Pearl, Fritz talks, of, talks about oscillation. Right, so the, the nascent terms of this were really in here. Or uh, as we'll, we'll see as we begin to look at, at image, only would talk about uh, Octor Asen and the way of, of the, the pairs of complementaries, the two sides, which are, of course, known well in the Jungian uh, communities as well, that Jung was saying, oh, it's really about the complementarity of, uh, of the unconscious process. That's, that's the structure of the unconscious is this, is this uh, sort of... Uh, oscillation process, red-blue, right? So, so that's the other level at which we're trying to attune. We're trying to attune to that person's conditioning that has them either going, and I'll, I'll reference this chart again. Thanks, Brahm, you're already on it. Um, uh, that, that we're attuning to the system that has either got this excess inhibition, so the arousal cycle will come up, and then it will fall back down without hitting its ideal intensity threshold. So that's, when a system is doing that, I need to attune well enough to intervene around that, uh, that issue, or failure of inhibition, that is, the system is exceeding, it's, it's going beyond, it's overshooting, it's a regular and normal expected intensity threshold, or it is failing to complete that deactivation, that is, even if it does hit that ideal threshold, it will begin to deactivate, but often just pop right back up to the next topic, the next, the next red, the next problem, the next what's wrong because of the what's wrong addiction, uh, and then it'll, it will not complete that, that paradigm that resets the system. So attuning at that level uh, is uh, another simultaneous agenda that, that we have. And then lastly, once we get into phase three, we're going to be attuning to the way that material is presented. Often around the implicit process. That is, uh, this is why like working with trauma and explicit trauma is, is not a good idea because that intensity is actually what takes uh, people over those ideal thresholds. Um, and again, I'll just, I'll just do the caveat that I always do. We always start where the person is. In the class, we learn a lot about how to work where, where a person is. So, uh, uh, and uh, that is, they come in with explicit content. Uh, but attunement means I need to attune to them when they bring in their content. Right? And so when we come in and attend to that content, we are going to be working the paradigm where we are 
reinforcing self-organizing information, and the system over time, through that shaping paradigm, begins to back down from its high intensity and then come back to a level where we can reset and then we can rework these thresholds once the system has deactivated enough. So uh, that's, that's just to say that, for instance, uh, processes that are looking at high intensity, processes that are working with trauma and explicit trauma can be helpful at first if we're really then reinforcing in the way that I'm suggesting to reinforce in a, in a positive psychology sense those aspects of experience, but that's only, that's only phase two, right? Phase two work. Uh, in the end, we need to figure out how to do that phase three work and that phase three work then we learn more and more in the heart training, human empowerment, human empowerment, resiliency training, and in the OI expert course. Right, so attunement needs to happen at all of these different levels. Our topic today will be the attunement in the isoma range, the attunement in, in isoma, that is the uh, attunement to uh, image. Isoma stands for image, sensation, orientation, meaning, and affect. And this, this uh, cartography, again, really began uh, out of the Olney tradition as Olney was bringing in Akhtar Asen. If you look in, in Asen's book on eidetic psychotherapy, Asen begins with the ISM, the image, sensation, meaning. And uh, you'll notice, you know, as, uh, for instance, Peter Levine uh, would talk about the Saibam model, uh, what, what he did then was to bring in affect. But uh, Asen said uh, that affect belongs properly within image. Very interesting idea, right? That is, he said the image is actually for us more primary and that the affect is within that. That, that makes sense from my perspective because people have, uh, as a baseline, our culture, our Western society in particular, has so much dissociation freeze in our, in our days now of uh, the age of dissociation, which I call it the age of disintegration. That is, that is there is so much image. Image is so prevalent and so helpful and so popular and, and does hold much of the affect because there's so much freeze. If you have freeze, you don't have a lot of affect. So it makes sense that in looking at a system, Austin, and uh, would then say, ah, yeah, this image and affect is in there, and it, and it is. So uh, we'll, we'll talk about work with image uh, in, sh in a short time. Uh, but just to say that as we're developing this cartography, this isoma cartography, um, uh, what, I, what I have done here uh, in, in that cartography from Asen and then Peter's uh, uh, sort of uh, shift on it, I've shifted it again to include orientation because that's so key. Getting the attention into the external environment, I've, I've talked about that in many, many places. So uh, that isoma area is a place where we want to begin to attune because in all of those channels, there will be organizing information. So uh, we're going to look at those channels in particular today with more, in more detail. I hope to take some of your questions and, uh, and then we'll talk a little bit more about attunement as it relates to good phase two work in the levels of isoma. And thank you for your feedback about last, the last class. Um, if you haven't seen your last class uh, in the, the last family room, check that out. As a member, as an OI member, you have access to this whole library of information. Uh, whether you're at the OI Basics, whether you're a heart member, uh, human empowerment and resiliency training, or whether you're in OIX, uh, there is a massive library of learning that's available to you. And, uh, and so uh, people found the last family room on phase two stabilization to be a, uh, a helpful, uh, very helpful thing. So, but thank you also for your feedback on that. that. That helps me know what really registers with you. So feel free, when, you know, when you're looking at these or when you're seeing those, uh, pop, send me an email, let me know, you know uh, what, what feels good to you. <laughs> uh, and just say, oh, I feel good, uh, and let me know. Because uh, then that tells me, that helps me shape the direction of the information that, I, that I'm handing out here. So um, I will try to keep track also of, uh, of the questions that you have. Brahma, I may need help getting on, uh, uh, getting online. I'm, I'm on family rooms, but uh, join the next family room broadcast. Ruh-roh. Scroll down. 
All right. All right, good. So I'm on. Thanks, Brian. So I'll be, I'll be looking for your comments here and, uh, and be able to, uh, to comment. Uh, uh, the usual suspects, of course, uh, Boss, Nathan, Kitty, uh, Bibiana. Hi, Rachel. Uh, and looking, uh, looking to, uh, looking forward to seeing you guys uh, before too long. Uh, I know Boss uh, is going to meet me in um, in June in Belfast for the trauma conference. There, uh, we're excited for that. It's called the Trauma Summit. Uh, so, if you're uh, available and interested in meeting with and he learning from some of the really the world's leading authorities and experts on on trauma, uh, that trauma summit in Belfast is, is going to be a good one. And it's just the first impulse. I, uh, I've been in conversation uh, with uh, the founder of that process and the, and the proponent of that process, Clive. And so uh, he has a, has a real significant vision. And uh, anyway, uh, more to come. Hope you'll, uh, hope you'll uh, enjoy, enjoy that. Um, so uh, attunement. Uh, so send in, send in your comments. That's, that's the bottom line there. Uh, send in your comments. Uh, attunement in phase two, isoma, the image channel. Uh, again, so uh, OIX has this whole course on, on image, uh, and that's, uh, that is from image to archetype. There's so much to say here, and, uh, and uh, I would refer you also back to uh, the image work that's been integrated in... in uh, Say the somatic fields, that of uh, Octor Asan, um, uh, uh, Patrick Welcome from uh, from Chapel Hill, as a uh, as a, a Deacon fan, you know we should we should probably talk, and I uh, uh, hope all is well there in in Chapel Hill. So um, as a um, as a work, the image channel has specific reinforcing um, specific potent forms for reinforcing self-organization. <clears throat> so this uh, information means uh, something like the best use of image is when the person says something that evokes an image. It's also possible to feed back into a system the images that are coming uh, into your own mind as you begin to work. Uh, in particular, as you're working with image, there are going to be um, three, three broad classes of information that tend to be more organizing than not. Uh, and those, those three aspects are going to be something that's brighter rather than darker. Red and blue are always these complementaries. And blue uh, uh, can, mean, can mean deactivation, but it's really about organization, the, the specific organizational information that is, that is coming across. So blue things, organizing things in image, are going to be the brighter things. And we're always looking for the two sides. So um, to be able to distinguish between two things uh, is, is a whole process in itself. And, and I'll talk, for instance, in shifting paradigms about the science of what's known as the just noticeable dif difference, JND, out of uh, psychology and, and the physiological psychology that we, uh, we study in later uh, membership levels of organic intelligence. That, and that just noticeable difference means that there are certain thresholds of perception that one can be aware of. So in order to have two things, you have to be able to distinguish between them. Uh, and and there are actual equations in different perception. There are equations. There's an equation for for um, sort of mapping out the, that just noticeable difference. And there are, uh, is a clear marking out of how the neurophysiology can detect those differences. For instance, to notice a drop of perfume in a like a like a room that is. 40 square feet. That's, that's where you can begin to notice it. That's the just noticeable difference. Or in the visual system, it's something like a candle burning uh, about uh, a mile away or three quarters of a mile away. That's, that's the threshold of perception there, right? So this notion of threshold is so key uh, in organic intelligence, uh, whether you call it cusp or threshold or phase transition, whatever language you use, uh, then uh, that's organic intelligence talking about these thresholds 
because that's key in the neurophysiology, and it, it can be regular, and it becomes visibly regular when you get to phase three, and that, that oscillatory process becomes periodic. So uh, in, the, uh, in the image work, to see an image, for a person to see an image in their mind, often it starts out as undifferentiated. They might say, oh, it's just gray, or it's just dark, I can't see anything. And then the differentiating question that we're asking across all these layers of isoma is, okay, so first of all, we start with where the person is. Okay, so uh, it's, it's all one thing. So as you look at that, as you look at that, that's a specific phrasing. Again, this comes out of the Ericksonian uh, uh, really understanding of the, the language of facilitation uh, that, that I'll talk about elsewhere. Uh, that, that as you look at that, meaning I'm now talking about what you're doing, that's attunement. As you're looking at that and seeing that it's all dark, are there any places that are more dark? So you might, you might think, oh, wait a minute, we're looking for a place that's more light. But for a system that is attuned to red, that is attuned to what's wrong, what is easiest for them to perceive is what's less positive. So I'm going to begin there. Oh, is there... As you look at that, are there any places, for instance, that are darker? Or here's the oscillation language. Or are there places that are lighter or something like that? You hear how open-ended this is. It's, it's really this invitation to be, for the person to be curious because that state of curiosity is part of orientation. That state of curiosity as a reflection of that ventral vagal system, the curiosity, exploration, orientation, that we are, we are cueing for, subtly priming for that person's state that is necessary, right? In phase two, uh, what we are looking at, sorry, bro, is uh, this orientation to become well-established Orientation is connecting to the environment through the senses as a proxy for that ventral vagal system. Curiosity is one of the keys. So as you're looking then and seeing that it's, that it's all dark, right? that's what they're doing, that's what their situation is, then is there a place, for instance, is there any way that you might notice that is more dark or maybe more light? So I begin by the attunement. This is their likely frame. Oh, is it more dark or is it more light? And that's offering that oscillatory shift all within that question of might, which is this curiosity question, right? So all of that is packed into this single sentence. So as you're seeing that and it's all dark, I'm wondering, might there be an area that is more dark or more light? Let's just see what you notice and inviting then the person's attention to that to begin to do that distinction work to see if there is a just noticeable difference between those two. Because to set up the oscillation, you have to have things in oscillating. Those are the reds and blues, the associative complex. Those are the reds and blues. And then we're going to ping the blues. We're going to ping those that are disproportionately more organizing. In this case, in the visual channel, it's going to be things that are more light. Oh, okay, so ah, you see, all right, it's looking like a black hole. So that's, that's super. You've got a black hole, which means that you are seeing depth. You're seeing dimension. How do you see dimension when it comes to color? Shading, light and dark. Okay, so you see that. And so is it more dark in the center? Is it more dark on the outside? Is it more light on the outside? Oh, okay, so it's more dark in the center and it's more light on the outside. There are the two. I wonder if you would just be willing to look especially at that lighter part on the outside. Begin to see that lighter part and just see what happens if it changes or if it stays the same as you tune to or you look at a little bit more of that white. That's the movement of orienting the person more toward blue, the, more toward the organizing information. The tendency will be to get drawn into the black hole, of course, right? That's the addiction to intensity. That's predictable. That's the, that's the person's system that is victimized by the conditioning system of the addiction to what's wrong and the addiction to intensity. So, so first dimension, working with image, light and dark, especially on that light side. Second is something that's moving rather than static. Uh, so, okay, so you're, you're seeing uh, this... This, uh, this fractal image, you're seeing this, this geometric figure of, say, a uh, pyramid. Uh, and in that pyramid, um, 
what what are you noticing? And 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 the person in, in this case, in terms of talking about movement, might say, well, it's like uh, like it's at an oasis, and there's this shimmering, this kind of almost glittering sort of foreground, and so there's this shimmering. Okay, so you notice the pyramid, fixed. <laughs> it's about as fixed as it gets, right? Um, and uh, and uh, at the same time, there is this shimmering. I wonder if you would just notice that shimmering, especially, and just see what happens as you begin to notice that shimmering, that 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 sort of thing. And it's like, oh yeah, it's like it's moving. And how is it moving? Moving to the right, and it's got this sort of wavy form. Okay, so now just watching that shimmering. It's moving to the right, and then there is this waving form. Right? And that waving form begins to reflect back to us the sine wave which says that the oscillation is setting up. So that up and down, our, our basic graphic is a wave. Right? That's, our, that's our basic fractal. So many times people will describe ah, this wave form that begins to set up. And an image, uh, we're going to be looking toward how that shows up uh, and how the blues are typically more represented in movement rather than that which is immobile. Makes sense, doesn't it? If immobility is what is one of the most disorganizing influences in the, in the system, takes more toward phase one, then movement is going to be something else. Movement is oscillation, life. Movement, oscillation, pulsation, expansion, contraction, red and blue. So uh, the third thing, uh, that we would be looking for in image is then uh, going to be something that is more smooth than, say, jagged, right? Because uh, the, the smooth suggests continuity. Everything that we are doing is looking for the way that the system is self-organizing, which means it is restitching the fabric and network of its biology and the psyche. And that restitching, that reintegration means continuity of contact. Then shows us uh, that there is continuity between this level of intensity, because then the next threshold shows up, and there is continuity between this threshold, that rising to the next, and to the next, and to the next, and to the next. There is uninterrupted continuity of experience and reintegration in the associative network. By this, this natural oscillatory process, the biology becomes pulsative, and it does this continuity, restitches continuity of experience because the states are continuous. They're not like, oh, I'm having this oriented state, and oh my god, now I'm having a flashback, a panic attack, a trauma recollection. Those states are discontinuous, and it creates and reinforces dissociative experience, disconnection. When that reconnection begins to happen, the continuity is restitched in the neurobiology, then the associative network begins to make better and better associations, better and better pathways of links, and the network, that, that web of interaction, begins to restitch itself, including between all of the levels of isoma. So image is better communicating with sensation, and image and sensation are better integrated with the experience of orientation, and, and image and sensation and orientation are better than integrated with cognition and meaning, and all of those are then integrated into this experience of affect. Right? So all of the levels of isoma become stitched together in this web, in this network, in a way that the information that is helpful can be shared among these systems, making us more intelligent organically. All right? Good. So um, that's, that's our overall ethos and, and the way that we begin to use uh, image to really facilitate phase two uh, reorganization. Uh, so that's, that's, going, that's going to be a, a key. All right. Uh, and uh, uh, Daniel, uh, oh, oh, Paul reminds us that a decibel is the, is the just noticeable difference in audio that can be detected by people. Right. So thank you, Paul. Uh, hey, Andrew, uh, nice, nice to see you. Uh, and um, 
And so, uh, Danny, uh, Danny's uh, nice to hear from you. Hope hope things are are well for you uh, there in uh, in Middle East. Hey, if you haven't already covered this, he says, can you talk about eliciting image if it's not forthcoming from the client? So. Um, It's a good question and, and really uh, takes me to an, a nice next point. Uh, thank you, Danny. Um, so uh, our first uh, and most elegant intervention is if the image is suggested, if it is evoked and the, and the client is bringing it in, just says, oh, you know, I've got this, I've got this feeling in the pit of my stomach and it's like a, it's like a piece, of, it's like a lump of coal. There's an image, right? They've described something. It's like a lump of coal, and it suggests that maybe there is an image there. There are also times, uh, and uh, there are also times in which um, uh, uh, we will use um, and understand that overall with image, part of the value of that is that it gets something that is too intense outside at a safe different, at, at a safe distance. So we have this lump of coal. Okay, so you have this feeling like it's a lump of coal. What if you can just see that lump of coal, right, which is the safer experience than the sensation here? So we wouldn't just go to the sensation. Okay, so feel that lump of coal in your belly. That's not, that's not our typical way to go. We'd say, okay, let's see that lump of coal, right? I'm just imagining that, which means, one, you have subject-object relationship, right? non-dualism non aside now, uh, we are going to reestablish connection by using that image process. Oh, just seeing that lump of coal, you can work directly in image, and uh, if you feel like there is enough stability in the system, if you reach a threshold of stabilization, then you might say, okay, so just seeing that lump of coal, and then going between that image and the sensation, and I'll often say like switching a channel on your remote control, on your TV, on your, on your channel, just going between that and this. And, and there, is, there is a rhythm to this. That is, I am priming a quality of rhythm in this. It's, diff it's a different thing to say, okay, now just go back and forth between that image and your belly, your image and your belly, your image and your belly, bop, 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 bop. That's a fairly rapid oscillation. Or you could say, okay, I'd like you to do this. Just shift between the image, lump of coal, and then go back to the belly. So you go from the belly back to the image. Bum, 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 bum. We are priming for a rhythm of that shifting of attention, the oscillation. There is, an, there is a quality of rhythmicity here that I am going to be priming. And again, we'll, we'll talk about this more when, when, you, when we do more uh, in-depth work. But we're not just communicating words, we're communicating timing. If you, if you read the blurb, uh, say, on our Facebook page about, about this, what we're doing, the, the interventions look like what everybody else is doing. Right? They are, okay, let's work an image, let's work in sensation, let's, let's, let's do cognitive work. Now let's, let's track your affect, right? L there's all of that that's happening. Um, but it's not so much what we're doing, but when. We're working with this, the psychobiology. We're working with a biological system, circadian rhythms, rhythmicity, rhythmicity. <laughs> <laughs> Rascal, you have. We're, we're working with rhythm in the system. So the rhythm of that suggestion is really key. So, okay, so now just going between that image and the sensation in the belly and back. And just like a, a work with the, uh, the remote control, go, go one and then the other. That suggests a quality of rhythm. And there's a specific meter to that. So, uh, so paying attention not only to what I'm saying, but when I'm saying it, and the meter, the rhythm with which I'm saying it, right? All of that is priming for the system. All of that's really key. It's part of why this really takes a while to learn, because I guess uh, you're probably figuring out now that it's not just what you say, but it's how and when, and especially the relationship to rhythm or, or not, uh, and attunement as well. 
Uh, I, uh, I was in Tucson a couple of weeks ago, and, uh, and this session will be, become available. But I, I worked with an, an acute situation because uh, one of our uh, esteemed colleagues who is a student in the heart training, her daughter was in an automobile accident uh, with, uh, with boyfriend. And, um, and so I worked both with she and, and boyfriend. And at first, the client came in, uh, the, our young friend, uh, the driver, the, the young man, and he was speaking pretty quickly. He was talking rather quickly. And so, uh, you know, there, he was moving quickly. There was a lot to say. There was a lot to tell, a lot to share, and there was a, a rapid movement. And so as he was speaking more rapidly, what you would see with me, as I'm doing with you right now, I'm sp I would speak rather rapidly. I'd pick up the pace because attunement means i got to get on the horse. The, you know, the, uh, the stagecoach is driving toward a cliff, and you can't just sort of be wait, you know, standing there going, hey, put on the brake. Oops, I guess that's not, that's not going to happen. Yeah. See you, Jacob. Uh, you've got to get on your horse and, you know, get up there and, and get with the stagecoach so you guys are in sync, right? That's, that's a tune also. So I, I began very, you'll see how I began with the speaking very rapidly. We're just joining with that, uh, which is also fun in a way. Uh, getting on a fast horse, if you know how to ride, it's good. Uh, and, and then uh, being able to then see how during the course of the session, things began to slow down. Things began to slow down. And, and as they slow down, it's not that slow is the point, it's rhythm. It's periodicity. It's regularity. Periodicity means meter. It means a rhythm that sets up. That's an organizing rhythm. At the end of the session, he said this, this thing that just that was so moving. You know, he said, you know, I thought I, was, I thought I was really okay. I thought I was, you know, pretty relaxed when I came in here. But he's like, I realize, realize now I was speaking and seeing. It was like I was in the third person. But now... I'm seeing through my own eyes. I'm, I'm actually, everything looks new. And like I'm seeing through my own eyes, right? That's, that's biosync reestablishment. So uh, I, hope, I hope you'll get to be able to take a look at, at that, uh, that session here upcoming. Uh, but uh, the point is that the, the person was able to reconnect. Uh, and Anne, uh, and you, were, you were there for that, uh, right? Welcome, Anne, uh, from Tucson. Um, so, uh, so being able to get that rhythmicity is really key. Danny, back to your question. So, uh, if an image is not forthcoming, and you th and you're you're reading that there is significant, likely significant freeze in that system, then uh, then you may like to pop something up in an image, especially if if the system is going to be has sort of the number two error, the failure of inhibition. So you see that there is acceleration because, say, the person is tracking a sensation, right? The person says, oh, I have this, this feeling in the, in the pit of my stomach, and it's, it's like, well, what, what is that? Right? Pretty open-ended question. What is that? Which is basically, what channel is that? What experience, what channel are you having that experience in? Is it a sensation? Is it an emotion? What channel is it in? And like, oh, it's just like, like this heaviness, like this heaviness, and it really it's like, it makes it hard to breathe even. And, and it's like my breath gets a little short, and it's like, I don't know, I, I begin to feel a little woozy, right? You see how it's, how it's jacking up. That system is, is jacking up. It's going down, you know, it's sort of in the spiral, but it is increasing in intensity. That's a good sign to go, okay, maybe I should not stay in the sensation channel. Maybe that's the channel of the Autobahn to hell. So let's not do that. Let us instead go, okay, so you're having that, and it's, it's this heaviness, and you notice this breathing. When you feel that place in the stomach, I'm wondering if there might be an image associated with that, or if you can see what that might look like if you were to pop that up into an image. Maybe just see what happens if you can see that belly experience in a picture, in an image in your mind's eye. So that's a way to begin to suggest to the person uh, and invite the person to shift channels and evoke, evoke an image. So that's a, that's a particular time that we would want to be able to evoke a, an image in particular. Um, there, are, there are other ways and other things that I'll talk about an image. When, when you, for instance, 
you know, you get an archetypic image or, or like geometric fractal patterns show up. We are not trying to do anything for that. Just, this, is a, this is just a little wink toward image and archetype in the OIX class. Uh, but we want just to let that happen. That means there's integration currently happening. So again, when the integration is happening, when the blue line is happening, I don't want to do much with that because that's the goal state. And that's a better intelligence than anything I might, I might add at that point. So, uh, so I'm just going to be supporting the person to just experience that as it is. Okay, just seeing that and just being curious and more or less just watching that, see what happens as you see that, uh, that image of the geometric figures, you know, in motion. Just letting that fractal pattern happen, something like that, okay? So that's, that's what I have time to talk about on image, more in image and archetype in the OIX course. Um, uh, the next, in, next channel is sensation. I've already said a lot about that. You know, my, my uh, previous work as a somatic experiencing uh, instructor for 17 years, uh, we worked a lot in sensation because it's called somatic experiencing. So there's a lot to say about that, but the overarching guide from organic intelligence is in all of those isoma channels, what's going to be the channel that takes us, takes that system up to its ideal intensity threshold and down. Uh, in phase two, uh, that information is going to be primarily sensations that are positive at first. Like our our main phase two work here is to begin to look for those elements of experience that at first have positive affect. So this is a distinctly positive psychology for sure, but we're going to be looking for a, a sensation that the person basically says, I like it. More, more than the other things, I like this one. And much, 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 much of our work can actually be done through that. We'll call it blue. Uh, we'll call it stabilizing blue, and we can get that in, uh, in sensation. Sensation and positive sensation, something that a person likes. Uh, again, there is this bifurcation. There is the approach system, and there is the avoidance system. There is that which I am moving toward and that which I retract from. And, uh, and as we're speaking of sensation, at first, we are trying to set up stabilization through orientation, connecting to the environment through the senses, and then coming towards sensation only through the blue channel, only through that which feels well. Because if you stay in blue sensation too long, it'll shift over into red. It will, it will change. And we need to develop this, uh, this network and the, the ability of the attention to reside in positive affect and positive sensation without getting drawn off into red. So the first work that we will call uh, this, this sandwiching work, sorry, I'm gonna grab, grab the sandwich here. Uh, our first work then is to be able to get the stabilizing blue and that we do that through what's called the half sandwich because in the half sandwich, we take out, and all the vegans, vegetarians, I'm sure you're jazzed about this, but you could call it tofu if you want, uh, or, or tempeh. So uh, our first work is to do this orientation. So this is the orientation part. This is blue, and back to orientation. So we'll do orientation as connecting to the environment through the senses. Go to blue, something that's pleasant. Translate that pleasant into blue sensation. Okay, so you ha as you enjoy the image of that palm tree swaying in the wind out there, then where do you notice that in the body? How does that resonate in the body? And then you get that blue sensation. When you get that blue sensation, get out of there. Get back to orientation so that the orientation allows the sandwiching of this blue without it being red. And we're going to develop that capacity of the system to just do orientation, blue orientation. So our half sandwiching is going to be a key at first, and we, we, are, going to, uh, we are going to diminish the reinforcement of going over threshold, that negative reinforcement. We're gonna, we're gonna limit the fueling of the negative reinforcement paradigm by dedicating ourselves to the work of orientation, blue and orientation.
only enter into the body through the blue door at first. Over time, as you gain more and more capacity, like, like this experience, I'll, 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 just, I'll just pop it over into this other. Yeah. So over time, this intensity, for instance, as we, as we get our, our fractal cycles lined out, uh, then this intensity, right, this intensity threshold right here, that might be the association with um, an auto accident beginning to happen. But when, uh, when that threshold is just the next logical threshold, that might not be too intense. So a person may have the sensation of their shoulders coming up, and they're going, oh my God, I saw the car coming toward me. Um, uh, that, that arousal level just ain't, ain't it's not going to be too much. It's not going to be negative reinforcement. It's just going to be arousal. It's going to be some, some excitement or some stimulation. It doesn't have to be negative in that way. And all of the other lower thresholds that used to be too intense, like, oh, you know, I, I just have this uh, kind of uh, sensation of tension in, in the trapezius muscles, uh, that's going to be uh, just a curiosity. All along here, the goal is to be able to experience life as it comes to you. And, uh, and when those thresholds bump up, intensities that used to be too much and like uh, unpleasant just become like matter of fact. It's like, oh yeah, I got that. It, it's, it becomes not negative because I've got so much range for it. I've got so much room for it. It's not, it's not threatening the threshold of uh, of my limit of uh, organic processing. Okay? So uh, sensation at first especially can be quite blue. In the end, one can be quite neutral and curious about sensations that used to be different, like, like an experience of pain in the knee. Okay, so now I feel oh, like there's a little ache right inside of there. But you can hear by the tone of my voice, it's like, oh, that's this little ache. It's almost like I'm curious about it. That's different from being frozen and having been sitting, you know, in meditation going, now there's pain in my knee, and now it is moving across my knee to the underside of my hamstring, and then it's going into the, right? That's different. Uh, so uh, we want to be able to pay attention to those, those differences. And uh, over time, we can experience those intensities uh, without so much uh, challenge. All righty. All right, Mark, hi from, from Asheville, recommending Dr. Austin's book. Great. Uh, let's see, Nathan, um, image work, phase two. Yep, clients get drawn into the red vortex and back to phase one. Yep. Um, yeah, so, uh, so that's true, right? Uh, Nathan is saying has clients that get drawn back into red and then disorganize while they're trying to stabilize. Uh, right, so the, uh, it, it's, that's the law, right? The, the red vortex is uh, it's what's compelling. So uh, what that says is um, that, the, again, the first work, the first work of our, of our priming is going to be um, a couple of things. Uh, so I was going to say orientation, which, which, you'll, which I'll get to in a second. But the first work is conversation about what's going on, and I'm pinging their things that they're doing well, the things that are primarily organ organizing, things that are more helpful, moments of curiosity, reflecting on their blues. Everything has a red and blue side. Everything has a disorganizing and organizing side. And I'm going to do conversation that's not too intense. When w persons are going inside, right, when we're getting out of the orienting conversation, the free association conversation, right? Remember, free association conversation means we are engaging enough in the relationship that the person's attention is non-self-conscious. That is, the attention is coming out is not self-referencing. Right? By the time a person gets to image, now they're self-referencing. By the time they get to sensation, self-referencing. Tracking a thought, self-reference. Affect, self-reference. We're trying to get a non-self-conscious conversation so that we keep the attention out. So I'll often say that we need to be more interesting than the red vortex. 
So uh, I don't invite a person's internal experience until I'm pretty sure that the strange attractor of red isn't going to get them sucked in there, which means uh, we have to, first of all, get our orientation, and then we get, need to get blue stabilized, and we get, need to get that first wee cycle of, of arousal through, through low, low intensity, right? Low intensity, which is orientation, blue, like a positive affect thing, which is exciting. So here, blue is red. And this is, this is classic for us. That is, blue in this context uh, is, is red, meaning that in the context of, of this early cycle of arousal, de-arousal, the first arousal comes through positive affect. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm curious, I'm interested, I'm stimulated in some easy way, and then I let it go. I begin to relax a little bit. So, so there, the first stimulation cycle is through positive affect. So I have the positive experience of orientation connecting to the environment through the senses, positive stimulation, and then back down through orientation. So that we cycle is so secure, and I don't go internal until and unless I can get uh, that person's system not to pop over into, into red. That means, uh, one, I'm going to do more of that, that shaping process that I talked about about the work with phase one, just reinforcing regularly, empathizing with the person, but also disproportionately reinforcing around their blues and orientation. And then uh, when there is sufficient stability, I'm going to go in, but go in briefly enough that, uh, it, uh, that, I, that I can get out. So if we're working with image, um, then we would be trying to disproportionately uh, look at their blues. So uh, I, would, I would first prime their awareness to say, Okay, we're just gonna we're gonna uh, track this just a little bit in image, and then we will we'll come back out if that'll be okay. So uh, so the person may say, um, uh, Nathan, I'm not sure what image was was coming up. Uh, let's say, oh, I just I just saw an image of my partner, and so uh, that's that's rife with red and blues, right? Uh, and so uh, so I would I would prime for how this is going to happen. Say okay, we're gonna let's in a second. We're just gonna take a look at, at your partner, but we're gonna do it fairly briefly. And I want you to just to focus on say the aspects of their face that that seem to be most warm to you. So so just for now, let's just look at you know this person that you really care about, and just see if you can see something about their face that uh, that seems so appealing to you. Like what is it about their look that looks nice? And just taking a look at that, and then as you do that with the eyes open, I'll just uh, just notice that, and then let's talk about this for a second. If you don't mind, we'll just come back out. What was it that you saw that, that looked, you know, like more inviting? So we've just, we've, we have been orienting, pre-association conversation. Here comes partner, which has red and blues just ready. We go in with them primed to say, okay, so I'm just going to go in a little bit, and then as they go in a little bit, ah, then let's come back out and chat about this. So we, we offer that contact and context and empathy and real relationship as a way of beginning to process information from uh, the partner relationship. Just pinging those blues and then getting back out, something like that. That has to be after, however, a sense that I may have that they can actually do that, uh, that orientation, blue orientation. And, and the, people need to practice this at home. Phase two stuff is stuff that they can, they can handle at home, typically, and need to practice orientation in particular. Now, having said that, just remember that um, the, the closer the person's system is to phase two, the less home, the more specific and structured their homework needs to be. Write down three things that you can see five times a day that look okay to you. Well, that's a pretty structured thing. So they, they take five times in a day and they sit down with their journal and they, they look around. They go, what three things are like things that look okay to me? And notice it's not like three positive things, right? That's asking for more intensity. Looking for things that are just normal. Orientation is just material, physical reality and connecting to the physical material reality. We are 
priming with a little bluish, bluish hue, uh, but it's going to be very brief. Just three things that look okay. In other words, normal stuff, not like, okay, look around and, oh yeah, gaze uh, onto that, that picture that reminds you of grandma. Not that, uh, but we're just going to ping that, okay? So uh, that, is, that is a bit of our work. And then in stabilizing blue is a real key. This is where sensation comes in most prominently. When a person begins to get that stabilization, then I'm going to go towards sensation, which means that I have confidence they can do that, that sandwich first without sensation. And sensation is a whole other language to begin to learn. And, and in organic intelligence, I provide quite an, a lot of support for ease of rehearsal of sensation awareness through body scan uh, techniques that, and body scan meditations that allow this, uh, this quick and uh, ready mapping of sensation, learning the language of sensation better and better of the body, mapping the body better so that people can practice this without risking uh, too much red. Okay? So uh, practicing that in the phase two, using then sensation to stabilize blue. Four steps of stabilizing blue means uh, uh, the person is having you know, experience that is, that is positive. So m one of my famous ones, of course, is this, uh, this movement right here. So uh, the four steps mean to, tr to notice it, so I'm noticing how my, my foot is in motion again. Uh, and then the, the second is don't futz with it. Right? Don't, uh, it's, it's a challenge, but as soon as you begin to point out something to someone, they'll often go, they'll either one, stop it, they'll inhibit it, or they'll go, oh, yeah, yeah. And then they make what was spontaneous, they'll sort of, you know, kill it <laughs> by starting to do it. So there was learning this relationship to the involuntary is by don't futz with it. Just let it happen. The third step is enjoy that, uh, or is to, to really feel it uh, locally. Like, uh, okay, I'm feeling where the impulse is. I'm feeling the musculature. I'm feeling the movement. And, and then the fourth step, and that's, that's sensation, right? S step three of the orientation and the stabilizing blue uh, means that I am going to be in sensation. I'm going to track the physical sensation of this blue. The fourth step is then to recognize that this movement has a global intent. It has a biological intent. How can I begin to feel the sensation of that effect? So what does this do that I can feel this local sensation and then I enjoy it globally? I feel and I begin to sense in sensation the positive effect, the effect that this brings to my body. And as, as I'm doing this, in this moment, what I get is like an opening, really kind of a, in the trachea a little bit, and there's an opening in the throat and the upper chest, uh, and that, that becomes itself a very positive experience. So translating that, those are the four steps of stabilizing blue, classic way of using sensation and attuning really to the biology's movements towards self-organization, right? That's good phase two work. Orientation, I've talked a lot about, so we're going through the isoma levels, the, the orientation, I've talked a lot about that. Uh, and the best way to use orientation is when it's actually happening. That is, a person says, oh, I just, I just heard that bird. Or you notice somebody, you know, being distracted by something outside. That distraction is attraction. Every distraction is an attraction. So I want to I wanna be able to join with that. Oh, what was, yeah, was that a dove that was, that was out there? And be getting to ping on uh, those process, reinforce those blues that are happening, the uh, blue of orientation, meaning the organizing information that comes distinctly from the orientation architecture. So there is uh, that, that work with orientation, connecting to the environment through the senses, and I've mentioned uh, some of the aspects of that already in here, like just material reality. This is just physical world around here. It's nothing special, right? It's just the ordinary miracle of uh, living on the planet in this moment. Uh, M channel, the meaning channel, this is huge. So due diligence that each of us, I'm pointing at you now, uh, each of us needs to be doing because our thought processes are off the chain. Uh, and, uh, you know, there's a whole... Uh, set of folks who sort of say, okay, chicken or egg, is it, 
Is it the body or is it thought? Thought creates the mood, or is it the mood that creates the thought? Is it the, is it the thought that creates the state, or is it the state that creates the thought? Not concerned about that. Point is, when we, when we have thought, uh, we want to be able to learn relationship to thinking. This is part of why OI is a mindfulness-based approach, because we need to spend time sitting as well as walking and moving, becoming aware of thinking as a process. Thinking happens. It's a mechanism. So let's, let's be aware of, uh, of what that is and, and begin to track that and do due, due diligence. That is, the thought process is going to be uh, something that I'm, I'm going to, to track. So, um, so that thought process is that, um, you know, if there is a negative thought, then uh, what am I going to do about that? Negative thought happens, right? And, and it's one of the most common things. Critical, the critic, the judge, the shame, the, the you know, the harsh superego, however you talk about it, uh, then uh, negative thinking happens. What's my response to that? Usually, it's people going, oh, man, uh, you know, I feel so bad about myself. Or, or wow, you know, I, um, I, I am having negative thoughts, and, you know, that I'm just assaulted by that. The thinking process is not something that people do per se. It's something that happens. People lay claim to it. Oh, I am thinking negatively because it is happening within them, not recognizing it's a mechanical process. And that thinking process, that thinking about, oh, I'm having negative thought, that is part of the trick of the red vortex to keep you stuck. Right? In the red vortex zone, in that system, it's always, these systems are always self-reinforcing so that those thresholds don't increase. It, it creates a stability. The system says, oh, this is stable. We're going to stay here. So let me give you not only a negative thought, but a negative thought about the negative thought because that's going to keep you stuck. Instead, what I would prefer is to notice that the negative thought patterns usually have a large, undifferentiated and characterological assignment, oh, God, I'm such an idiot, or, well, I, you know, I'm really, you know, I'm so dumb, or something like that, uh, uh, or I'm such a schmuck, right? These are large characterological processes, and they're seductive in part um, because our response to them tends to be polar. Either, uh, I believe it, you know, I, I'm buying my thought, yeah, well, I'm, I am, I'm such a schmuck, so there's no critical method there, there's no critical or incisive leverage, or I just go, oh, gosh, I've got to stop that thought. So it's either, oh, that's, that's bad, I believe it, or that's bad, I've got to change it. Instead, let's, let's have a more differentiated approach in thinking. These thoughts are often seductive because they have an aspect of truth. You know, there's something about them that is probably, you know, helpful information. And a lot of uh, uh, therapy traditions and even in, uh, in mindfulness traditions, there is the notion like we're, we're just going to label thought. Maybe that's, that's a helpful first step. Uh, you know, I label it like, oh, there's a cloud going by. Okay, that's a thought. Label thought, label thought, label thought. Uh, as a way of getting a hold of some separateness from the thinking mechanism per se. Organic intelligence says there may be helpful information in there. So I'm not going to throw that thought out with the bathwater. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to allow that thought, and I may then say, ah, I just said I'm a schmuck. You know, I did this really su stupid thing. That may mean uh, I may want to do something different. You know, I, I, that may be telling me uh, I need a different approach. Oh, I'm, I'm afraid... Um, I'm afraid to ask my boss for a raise because, uh, you know, I feel, I feel powerless in the midst of that. Or, or uh, I'm afraid to uh, ask my landlord for a discount on my rent because it's, it's overpriced or something. Um, and that fear then comes in, and I, I think, oh, man, I'm afraid. I'm, I'm just a fearful person. Well, uh, maybe that fear is appropriate. Like, uh, if you just go to the landlord and say, please, could I, could I have uh, $500? They're just going to go, no, I don't think so. But if you instead take that fear and go, oh, yeah, I'm afraid because I don't have any power in that situation, so I'm going to do a phase two strategy on something else. I'm going to find out, oh, yeah, what's, what are the prices around? I'm going to go visit one, and, and I'm going to 
uh, be ready to put down a deposit uh, on that property and go I, yeah, to the landlord, hey, you know, I've been looking around at properties uh, and I'm thinking, you know, uh, there's, there's a property I'm looking at and it's a better price um, and wondering if, if you would prefer maybe that I stay here if you would be interested to give me a reduction, you know, get, get close to that price and, uh, and then, then, you know, I'll, I'd be willing to, to stay. You have leverage there. So the fear and is relevant, practically speaking. And, and in working with people in phase two, we work exactly that way. People come in and go, oh, I want you to work with my fear. I'm, I'm fearful. I've got this flight response. Maybe, maybe not. Right? Yeah, there's a flight response, but the way to get around that is by not necessarily focusing on the, on the red of that, but by harvesting the blue. That's meaningful information about practical phase two work that you need to do to, to actually be more strategically effective in your life. When you do that, you feel more powerful, you feel more blue, then you can reflect on that blue experience. So, um, so thought, then, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tease out the aspect of that information that may be there that's meaningful about how I'm supposed to interact in the environment, something I'm supposed to do, something that I'm supposed to work on, rather than you know, just succumbing to that broad characterological thought. And then I want to balance out thought process. So I say I'm a schmuck. Well, as a matter of fact, it would be, it's not a really great idea to just go to the landlord and say, would you give me 500 bucks? So I'm going to do something different. So yes, I have uh, this, this habit uh, uh, or this impulse to do something that wouldn't be unwise, and I'm going to make different choices. I can make different choices, and, and I do make different choices. So, um, so we're trying to give, then, the red. We're going to try to tease out the meaningful information in the red do strategy, prefrontal cortex that, that's phase two, right? We're going to do uh, prefrontal cortex on that, and then I'm going to balance out that red with an automatic blue. And instead of being characterological, I'm going to be very specific. So instead of saying, I'm a schmuck, uh, oh, God, I do such stupid stuff, I say, ah, yeah, I, I, that would be, there are times that I do things that are ineffective or unhelpful, and I am increasingly becoming more effective. So there's the both and. There's yes and, not just, oh, thought, or not just, oh, that's bad, i got to stop that. Thought stopping, sure. You know, if you want to limit and if you can limit your exposure to negative thinking, that's great. I talk about that as not feeding the bear, right? This, this bear comes in to your house, breaks in, and, in through the door, and st starts rummaging through your, your pantry, and then goes into the bedroom where you, you hide your, uh, your Butterfinger bars and, and starts munching there. Well, you, you don't, you know, you don't just throw more Butterfingers in there. Thought comes automatically. This is really helpful for your clients to know. Thought comes in automatically. I'm not responsible for the creation of the thought. That's automatic. I am responsible for how I respond to that thought. That's responsibility. So we, we don't feed it by going, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm re I really am a schmuck and, and getting down on oneself. I'm going to take various approaches. If you can stop the thought, if you can just go, you know, all right, uh, you know, you can bang some pots, get the, get the bear out of there, fine. But eventually, if you don't feed that, if you don't reinforce it, it'll leave. Right? So don't feed the bear. Don't reinforce that. And then, uh, then we're going to you know, try to firm up the doors and, uh, and get, you know, uh, get the, the, the place more stable. So that's a, that's a quick romp through thought, but uh, the, I hope that's, that's helpful for you. Uh, there's, there's more that I could say on that, more phase two work. But also, there's the, the phase two class in, in OIX. Uh, so the last one is affect feeling and uh, the emotion, the phase two work with affect. Uh, sometimes that's going to be, affect is the channel that is, is often the Audubon uh, to over intensity, going over intensity. And I'm going to wrap up here in, you know, the next, next four minutes or so. Um, and, and so um, affect then is uh, uh, one of the things that uh, in phase two, uh, work, we would want to begin to, to, one, recognize, because it's often the Audubon to the high intensity, one, we're going to be ready to shift channels. Shifting channels mean we're staying in the same state, but we're, we're focusing on a different 
facet of the state, but a different isoma level of the state. So if you have affect, one of the other channels that's, that's helpful to work with is um, like sensation. You can say, okay, so as you feel that anger, this is really important as you're working with self-protective responses, as you feel that irritation, frustration, how do you feel that in the body? Can you translate that affect into sensation? Because that's where the sensation then will begin to move toward thresholds that are latent within state-specific motor programs, you know, like pushing or, or shoulder moving or head movement and so on. Uh, so translating affect into sensation is, uh, is a helpful tool. Uh, and then also uh, to be able to get to meaning. Sometimes if, if it's hot, uh, you know, in cognitive, in CBT, sometimes they'll talk about hot cognitions. So if the cognition uh, is hot and it means it has an affect, uh, if it goes primarily into affect, then, then it may be an attuned way uh, to work with that by going, oh, yeah, you're, you know, this grief is coming along and, uh, or this, this feeling is moving through. Any sense of what that's about? It's, it's a little counterintuitive, right? Because we're thinking like, oh, I'm not supposed to do explicit content. But here, the emotion is already there. The state is here. And then you have all of these other isoma channels that are in there. Let's pop it over into meaning because it's attuned. People feel often very attuned to when you ask them about explicit content. Oh, you're having this emotion. Is there any content with that? Is there, is there something that is coming, an association or a thought that's about that? And to bring it into thought <clears throat> then brings it into conversation, which may move it into more of that non-self-conscious interaction that we would know as a part of the free association conversation priming for more ventral engagement, as opposed to being focused internal, which would catalyze the intensity, we can come back more into the conversation, thinking then as a conversational vehicle, then helps that system deactivate a bit. So one of our most common phase two tools will be to, if the affect is taking the system over threshold, really helpful to then pop that into another channel. Elaborating it also can be done through image. And, uh, and um, let's see. Um, so the whole, the whole question of evoking uh, image, for instance, could be here. So as you have that affect, I wonder, as a way of elaborating this, uh, I wonder if you'd be willing to like see an image of that and let that image evolve a little bit. So to be able to cultivate the affective experience by using image, right? Remember the association that Dr. Austin was, and, and Jungians know this as well, right? That the, the, uh, the integration of image and, uh, and affect can be uh, really helpful. So that's, a, that's, really, uh, that's really a helpful uh, process. Um, uh, Jerry's talking about the helpfulness of homework assignments. Look, on... Um, on our OI uh, Facebook page, maybe that's a helpful place to begin to talk about ideas for homework, um, uh, something like that. Jerry, I think you're an OIX, right? So, uh, by the way, I was just talking to Mark uh, the other day. So, um, so anyway, uh, uh, let's see. Mark Reed from Asheville, enjoying Dr. Austin. Uh, Paul, as a, as a video, uh, as a film editor, says it synchronizes so well with editing, with teaching editing, with the process of making movies. Hi, Amanda. Um, what do you do when the client says they have no resonance inside with the external thing that they are de deriving pleasure from? Um, uh, one, we'll just do repeated work. And that's a, that can be a homework assignment. Okay, just, uh, just see what kind of resonance you can get. People often get uh, hung up on doing it right. So uh, sometimes I'll ask people to just say something. What, m what might it be? Or what might it be in somebody else? You use that projective process to then elicit a response that gets things moving in that way. So they don't have to identify what it is within themselves. They could, just, they could also pop that into an image. So maybe just pop that into an image and then let uh, part of that image of, say, your body light up. Uh, and just see where it lights up and see what part of the body lights up. Like maybe it'll glow or it'll have a color or 
you know, maybe, you know, maybe a flower will bloom there. Who knows? Uh, but you could, you could go through image. Uh, because if the person's having trouble getting to physical sensation, it means probably there's significant uh, issues with their, uh, they probably have significant dorsal influence or freezy business. So pop it up into image. Freezy business, image work, pop it up into image, something like that. Uh, right. Cool. Uh, I reckon that's about our time for now. I hope this, is, this has been like chock full. Thank you so much for, for connecting. If you guys uh, don't know each other, uh, you know, ping each other on, on our Facebook page or something. All of the folks that have been, been checking in there, thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to be in touch with you. I've been uh, at the heart training, human empowerment and resiliency training in Berkeley, uh, in Burlingame, in San Francisco Bay Area last week. Before that was Tucson. It's so nice to, to be with our friends there and so appreciating the support of the mentors and mentor team. Uh, and uh, as you know, uh, we have the Oh, I Feel Good project going. There are more coming. I can hardly wait to tell you about that. Uh, but uh, for now, I have to say so long. And uh, thank you for joining this family room. And next family room will be a family room with Heather Roos, where we're going to talk about spiritual direction, organic intelligence, and the, the framing and the understanding of spiritual uh, work from within the standpoint of uh, of organic intelligence and spiritual direction. Heather Roos is going to be here, spiritual director here in San Diego. So thank you for joining, and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you next time. Be in touch.